Good thing you don't have to. Hello, how's everybody doing? Hey Dan, how you feeling? Doing good. Hi, everybody. Welcome to the school committee meeting for Thursday, April 15th, 2021. Um, I'd like to call the meeting to order. I am going to start by um, turning the meeting over to Dr. Bayetta for the reorganization of the school committee. Madam Chair, thank you. Um, first of all, just for the public to know, we are live at Norton Middle School. Uh, this evening as well on as on zoom uh, and it's being recorded um, first of all madam chair thank you for your year of service this year it has been a year like no other i don't think any prior uh, um, chairperson has had to deal with zooming and calling and everything else that you've done and you were great and i appreciate um, your flexibility with me during the year as well um, at this time um, the um, because of the annual town meeting just taking place the current chair turns over um, the meeting to me, of which I will uh, enter a motion to recess. No, just kidding. Um, looking for nominations for uh, chairman of the Norton School Committee for the um, remainder of this year and, until the next election. Dr. Beata, can I make a motion? You to may. Appoint Denez Savez as chairperson for the Norton School Committee. Mr. Savaz has been nominated by Ms. Gallagher. Is there a second? Second. Second by Mr. Sheedy. I need a motion to, uh, excuse me, are there any other nominations? Hearing none, at this time, I need a motion to close the nominations and require a single vote to appoint Mr. Savaz as chairman for the following school, for this upcoming school year. So moved. Ms. Gallagher, second, please. Second. Mr. Sheedy, congratulations, Mr. Savas. The singular vote has been cast on your behalf. At this time, I turn over the meeting to you um, to uh, begin the process of looking at vice chair, and I'll take you through each of the uh, different ones. All right, well, thank you, I guess. Um, <laughs> okay. Uh, all right, let's, uh, let's open it up for nominations for, for vice chair. Um, and I would actually nominate Dan Sheedy for vice chair. And it's the second. 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 Sherry Cohen with a second. Any other nominations? No, nope. seeing none, I would cast a single vote for Dan Sheedy as vice chair. Uh, sorry, I'm closing nominations. Need a motion to close the nominations? So moved. OK, 
Gallagher. Second. Sherry Cohen, second. Mr. Do Chairman. To, do we need to actually vote on that motion? Nope, no, it's a singular no. vote. Okay, I would cast my singular vote for Dan Sheedy as vice chair. Congratulations, Dan. Thank you very much. Look forward to it. Maybe. Okay. All right, uh, next up, we're going to be uh, are we appointing or are we electing the. Okay, does, does anybody not want to continue to do the job they're doing? I'm fine. Sherry? I'm fine. Okay, you're, you're the X factor on this one, I think. <laughs> I keep forgetting to unmute. Um, no, that's fine, I'll stay on Capitol. Okay, and Dan, you're, you're fine staying? Yeah, that's fine, I'll stay on legislative. Okay, Kathleen? Yep. Okay, all right, so we'll, we'll continue as, uh, as we are currently with Carolyn and I in negotiations. Uh, Sherry is on the permanent building. Uh, Dan is on, um, uh, sorry, uh, legislative. legislative representative and Kathleen is the SPED PAC rep. Could I ask that you request a motion to just have it as one slate motion? Sure, sure uh, I would request a motion to have it as one slate. So moved. Second. You have Sheedy, uh, Sheedy and Cohen. You can take your call. We vote. Okay. Uh, all those in favor of those nominations as um, as read. Sherry Cohen. Yes. Kathleen Stern. Yes. Dan Sheedy. Yes. Carolyn Gallagher. Yes. And Denise Savas is a yes as well. Five zero. Okay. I think that's it for the reward, right? Correct. Okay. We're going to move on to the uh, the minutes for the March eighteenth, twenty twenty one open meeting. Has everybody had a chance to read the minutes? Yes. Okay, are there any uh, changes or amendments to it? No, seeing no. none. Seeing none, I would entertain a motion to approve the meeting minutes for March 18th of 2021. So moved, Carolyn Gallagher. Second. Second. And Jeannie, second. Second by everybody. <laughs> <laughs> uh, all those in favor, Sherry Cohen? Yes. Kathleen Stern? Yes. Dan Sheedy? Yes. Carolyn Gallagher? Yes. And Denez Savas is a yes. Gallagher, Sheedy, 5 0 vote. I'm sorry? Uh, you know what? We didn't. Would you like to? <laughs> we can do it very quickly. Uh, my, my apologies, actually. It's, it's been so long since we've been in person that we forgot that we typically do a Pledge of Allegiance uh, to start the meeting. We're going to do that now. I didn't undo my cord. <laughs> Pledge allegiance to, to the, flag the flag of the United, United States, States of America, America and, to and to the, the republic, republic for which it stands, stands one nation, nation under God, God indivisible, with, with liberty and justice for all. Okay, next up we have warrant information and I'll turn it over to Sherry Cohen for that. I have reviewed and approved the following warrants. School expense warrants, March 18th, 2021, $275,621.86. April 1st, 2021, $298,178.79. And school payroll warrant, March 25th, 2021, $982,536.95. I wish to enter that into public record. All right. Next up, we have the student representative update. I see we have Zoe and Malia with us. You guys want to kick it off? Sure. So um, we're going to start with the JTS. Um, so we asked this week, we asked for actual quotes and thoughts from kids on the full return to school. So starting with the JCS with Mrs. Magna's kindergarten class, they said, we make new friends. Yes, we have fun. It's weird fun, but fun. Someone said, it's a little noisy, but I'm happy to be with all my friends in school. I liked it better with less cohorts because it was less noisy and less crowded. And then someone said, I kind of miss my mama and there's lots of people on buses. <laughs> um, 
so Mrs. Sorry, Mr. Oakley's grade three class said, I'm happy to be in school because I get to see all my friends. It's easier. It's easier because it's easier to go in person. I kept missing some meetings when we were remote. Didn't we all? I am glad that we are in, we are full in person so I can make new friends and get to know more people. I'm very happy we are going in person because then I don't have to do learning at home work. I'm glad we're in person so I can play with all my friends and see my teacher. I'm happy we're back because now cohort one and cohort two are combined. So I have so many friends. So it seems like the JCS had a pretty positive reaction to it because I feel like most kids are just excited to have friends again. Um, I'm going to turn it over to Zoe and she's going to do the LG. Um, so at the LG, kids were also pretty positive. Um, they said, great, there are more kids to become friends with. We get to play on the playground now. Monday was also added. It's really good. Um, they said, I'm happy we don't have to learn remotely anymore. It's amazing to be back. However, I only get to play with the kids in my class. And being here full time makes me nervous. Some kids don't always have their mask covering their nose. It's kind of like a whole school-wide problem overall with all the schools, I think, but um, we'll move on to the Yale. Uh, so for the Yale, um, he said, uh, he walked around asking the students what their thoughts on in-person school were, and they were overly positive with their responses. He said, so many said, it's awesome, it's amazing, or I love it. Um, when asked what made it so great, the majority of them said to be able to see all their friends, which is a common theme, and to be able to make more friends. Um, when he asked about the learning aspect of being back, they appreciated having their teacher by their side the whole time. Um, they said it was so much better because they don't have to figure out timing and scheduling for themselves. They love the projects because they can do grouping, group projects. Thank you. Um, they said it's nice to not have to do so much work alone on my own. Um, and it makes it easier to learn since I'm back. One student mentioned that they felt extremely stressed about the work when in hybrid. They got stressed whether they were doing it right, putting in enough effort, or just getting nervous about this. I thought this was a telling thought. They are fourth and fifth grade students. That is a lot to bear as nine, 10, or 11 year olds. Um, a lot of people at the Yale seem to be a little bit upset about the spacing, but I don't think that's something that can change. So I, I'd say overly, they were positive, which is good. So. Um, Zoe will do the middle school. Um, so the middle school was kind of pretty split with their opinions about with the kids that said stuff. Um, some of the positives were it definitely feels weird with double the amount of people, but I actually find that going back full time has made me more productive and has ma made me better with getting out of the house more. They said it's definitely been hard to get back into a full week schedule, but I do enjoy seeing everyone and getting back to normal. Um, it's, it is very nice being back in full time because you get more consistent learning. You are getting into more detail in projects because you have more time. I am also able to socialize more with both cohorts combined. I enjoy being with my teachers five days a week and knowing that I can ask questions any day of the week. So that's pretty good with the positives. Um, some of the negatives were that my opinion is that I don't like it. Even though I get to see peers I haven't seen that I haven't seen in over a year, the cons outweigh the pros. A lot of people in my unit are absent. I feel stress on myself. And in my unit, we never get homework since the teachers were nice and knew we had a remote day the next day. So there was no use in assigning homework. Now it feels like there's so much work to do and not a lot of time to do it. There is so much that changes and not enough time to adapt. I do not think it is going well. It is only the third week of school and so many people are quarantining and a lot of people have gotten COVID-19. I do enjoy socializing, but I think it is putting people's safety and learning at risk. I think these are pretty strong opinions on both sides of the spectrum, but it's good that they're actually voicing their opinions. Um, then we're moving to the high school. So for the high school, we actually just did a survey this morning. Um, our principal sent out a survey to the whole school we had a little over 200 responses, I think. Um, Malia is going to share her screen. So this is the summary of it all. So can you see this? Percentage? Yeah, all set. Um, so as we said, this is just this morning. And they said, now that we've been in school for 
a little over a week now, back full in person. Um, on a scale of one to five, how would you rate your level of excitement? 12 kids said they're not at all excited, but then we have the other end where 43 are very excited. Um, then we have the middle 71 and 84 and 33, all in the middle of the spectrum. So you can see that there. It is definitely leaning the majority towards very excited, but we also have to take into account that some kids are not happy about this change. Um, so here's basically the kids got to put in their opinions about it all and why they're excited or not. So the excitement, they were really excited because they got to be back with friends and more contact with peers and teachers, and they feel like it's all normal again, um, but not also having to live stream or spend as much time online. And they think that academic performance overall is improving. For low levels ex of excitement, they're not excited because they have to change their sleep patterns and they're more tired now <laughs> and safety concerns and longer days at school. So I think these we saw these for the other schools as well. So this is the comparison for March 5th when we were first deciding whether or not we we're going back to school or when we were going back to school full time. Um, we had showed this presentation before, but these are the graphs that show um, the changes overall. So it definitely seems that more kids are excited now that it's actually happening and they know what it's like, but it's definitely still a little mix everywhere. Um, so that's March 5th to now. And so on a scale of one to five, how concerned have you felt about safety? Um, not a lot of kids seem concerned, but there definitely are some kids who are still concerned. Um, 15 are very concerned, 39 are at about a four, um, but we do have that 71 who are not concerned at all. Um, and then here's the why they are concerned or not concerned because the greater exposure to people, mask wearing when kids don't wear the mask over their nose, um, large numbers of students being in quarantined and then not getting the same in-class experience, maintaining distances in classes and following the hallway directions because at the high school, we do have one hallway directions and it's some kids re rebel against that because they don't like it. But uh, Malia is gonna continue with the presentation. So we have another um, comparison here. It's pretty similar, except it seems that um, the amount of people who are extremely concerned decreased a lot here, which is great, because I think that the high school has been doing a pretty good job trying to keep regulations in place, even though you know there's going to be the kids who are going to rebel against it and the kids who are going to take their masks off. But um, we have, this was a question about, uh, in three or four words, describe how you felt in, uh, for to in-person return, returning to in-person learning, I'm sorry. Um, so this is like a little word cloud, I think, that Mr. Dolman made. Um, some of the biggest ones, excited, exciting, tired, happy, stressed, I like cool, that's fun, um, different. <laughs> so there's definitely a mix in here. They have stuff like monotonous and I've, which is pretty sure it's not meant to be there, but um, it's kind of interesting to see just how different everyone's thoughts are. You really aren't going to please everyone, but it's good to see that the biggest one on here is excited. Um, the suggestions for improvement were a lot of safety considerations with having waves for passing times, um, asking teachers to maintain distance as well, because it's not just students who slip up. Um, and someone said to forget about the one-way hallways. They create extra traffic and cause people to spend more time in the hallways when they don't really need to. For learning environment, uh, possibly some bonding activities at some point during a period between the cohorts. Uh, less homework, more notice for tests and quizzes. I agree with this for some reason. I feel like when we were um, when we were hybrid, it was a lot better to have that much more time to study and prepare, and that was one benefit to the learning that I think we're missing out on. Um, and having rules about how often assessments can be. Overall experience, the um, the majority said that it had made it better uh, and behind it was it has not changed and worse was pretty small. So that's good to see. Uh, workload just about right, too much and then way too much and too little. So I mean, that's going to vary based on class. But 
uh, and then work outside of school. So on an average night, how much time are you spending on work outside of traditional school hours? The majority said 30 to 60 minutes, which is pretty normal. Um, and then pretty close behind less than 30. And at 16.6, 60 to 90 minutes, uh, 90 to 120. And then a smaller portion said more than 120 minutes. So I believe that's it for the results. Yeah, that's the last slide. I'll switch back over. Uh, okay. So yeah, I'm not sure if Zoe has anything to add to that, but that was just kind of some um, quantitative stuff that Mr. Dolman collected for us today with the slideshow. Um, yeah. I think it's it's a pretty good representation of kind of a general like first week back feel because the high school's really only been back for a few days. It'll be our, the end of our first full week tomorrow. So we're all still getting used to it, but I think it's gone pretty good so far. If Zoe has anything to add? Um, no, I think we covered it pretty well, but I just wanted to say that just to remind, this is not coming from us. Like our principal made the survey, like we got the quotes from all the principals of the other schools. like. We're not going around and doing those quotes as much as we like presenting them. It's not us taking the credit. Like, Correct. It's yeah. We we refrain from doing the names just to not like in case the student doesn't want it. But those are actual like from kids, you know, to get everyone involved. It's not just us. Yeah, I think that pretty much covers it. Great guys, you uh, you continue to do a fantastic job. Um, I, I'm going to say really quickly, uh, one of your one of your slides mentioned what people were liking about getting back. I think it was, was specific to the high school and, and it was friends, normalcy and academic improvement. And, and quite frankly, I think that was always the goal here was to get those three things to improve. So it's, it's good to see that. Um, one, one quick side note, I, I noticed on one of your slides, you, you had a couple of comments about um, what I would consider less, less back to school and more, um, more the actual function of school itself. Um, the assessments, the time for homework, et cetera. I think it'd be interesting if down the line, maybe not not right away, but down the line, you guys um, gave us some feedback on that in a broader sense as well. So so think about that for, for down the line, if you would. Um, any comments or questions for me? Dan, are you raising your hand? Sorry, yeah, I was trying to get off of mute. Um, you know, just, just seeing the slides, I, I think it's worth it, um, you know, from Dr. Bayetta's level, General Neal's level, to, to send a reminder to, you know, the, the building leaders and the staff that, you know, we need to also educate our, our student body on the proper mask wearing. And if it continues to be an issue, then we, then, you know, that if that's causing students anxiety, then, then that's something we can easily deal with, um, with corrective measures and behaviors. So I think that's just important that we need to reiterate that from the top down that that has to be addressed uh, in every building. If that's what our students are telling us, then, then we need to, um, have our building leaders follow up on that, I believe. Dan, to your uh, question, that's been done in writing by the superintendent okay. of schools. So the superintendent is more than willing to meet with building principals and students pertaining to it overwhelming people. I don't think I can just continue to blanket a message. I think the yep. message needs to go to the people that are not following it according to what the students are saying. And that would require a process with that um, individual or group of teachers, but we have communicated it in writing. Sure. Um, multiple times. Great. Thank you. Though. Anything further? No. Okay. Uh, before we move on in the agenda, I'm going to, I'm going to sidetrack us momentarily here. If, uh, if people don't mind, uh, I wanted to very quickly just say a thank you to everybody who came out this past weekend to vote. Um, it's, it's an important civic duty, obviously, and, and, and a civic right. Uh, thank you very much for that. Um, the, the school committee itself did not change as far as the makeup goes. Um, I do want to extend a school committee welcome to Ms. DeVoe, who is our new selectman. Um, I want to also thank Mr. Bramwell for his service. He stepped down from the selectman after some years. I, I want to say it's 12 years because I think he and I are in the exact same, um, same cycle. Um, and I, I believe Brad was also at one point a school committee member in town as well. So he's, he's really put his time in for the town. So thank you very much to Mr. Bramwell for that. Um, more importantly, I, I want to take a moment to thank everybody who, who came out and voted in favor of the debt exclusion for the three town projects that we're doing as one. Um, it, it, was, it was super important to get that passed. It was a tight one. It, it, it wasn't a landslide by any stretch, but, but thank you very much to people who did that. Um, you know, it was always our intention 
to have that as as one project and it had been mentioned many times in, in in public meetings how we we thought that that was the way to do it one town one dream one one motion so i want to i want to specifically thank the board of selectmen who are the only ones who can actually move that question forward on the ballot they they saw that that was the way to get get that passed as as, as one motion so um thank you to them thank you to everybody who came out and voted for that um it, there is a second step to it now. There's a town meeting on May 10th, I believe, Saturday, May 10th, May 8th. I apologize, May 8th. Um, and and there's that, that we have to have a second vote on it, unfortunately. Um, but if everybody comes out and and votes strong, we should be able to get it passed. But it's it's great. Thank you. It, it's I'm proud to see this town moving forward as as one. Um, you know, something for everybody and everybody for something. That that's what it's all about. So thank you very much. Okay, uh, next up, we have the Norton Middle School Project 351 student representative. I'm gonna turn it over to Mr. Goldstein. Thank you very much. Uh, I, I am honored and I know Jacob is honored to be here this evening. Um, I believe this is the first in-person school committee meeting of the year. So it's uh, quite a momentous occasion for us to be here this evening. Um, so every year I, I, I am privileged to come here before the school committee and to talk about something that I am very passionate about and something that uh, we are very glad to be a part of, um, as is many of the districts around the Commonwealth. In fact, uh, 351 communities around the Commonwealth. So Project 351 is the largest uh, service project, service organization of its kind in the country. Uh, and the mission of Project 351, as I've stated before in these meetings, is that it is designed to train the next wave, the next generation of service leaders. And the when the project was begun, uh, about 11 years ago by then Governor Patrick and Carolyn Casey, the executive, ex executive director and founder, the idea was that eighth graders were an excellent age group to begin to train the next generation of service leaders. And so um, my involvement goes back about nine years. And so I've you know dedicated a lot of my time and energy towards this because I believe very strongly in the concept of service and the power of service. And so every year we are you know, we are allowed to choose one representative to represent the district and uh, to represent the middle school. And so this year, um, it was a pretty easy choice for me because the gentleman sitting to my left um, is, you know, an eighth grader who has distinguished himself early on. He distinguished himself in sixth grade by leading the charge in our Pennies for Patients campaign. For those of you who are not familiar with Pennies for Patients, it, it raises money for the Leukemia Lymphoma Society. And uh, he absolutely crushed it in sixth grade. And it was, you know, pretty easy for me to see that he was going to be someone to, um, you know, hopefully take up the mantle of Project 351 in service for the community because he showed a great amount of zeal in going ahead and, you know, leading that charge. So, um, so I'm very pleased to announce that Jacob Barry has been chosen as this year's Project 351 representative and ambassador for Norton Middle School and for the, for the community, for the district. So um, I'm going to let him speak a little bit about how launch went this year. In previous years and every other year, uh, non-COVID, non-pandemic years, in January on Martin Luther King weekend, they have the launch event where everybody from across the Commonwealth gathers in Faneuil Hall uh, for it to engage in a day long, uh, you know, day of service. And unfortunately, this year was not able to happen for obvious reasons. And so they had to delay launch and launch this year was an all virtual event. Um, so it was a little bit different for all of us. but. Um, but I know Jacob has been very diligent in attending all the online meetings and, and being a part of it. So um, I kind of will turn it over to him for a moment and let him discuss a little bit uh, about how launch went. And, and I know he wants to discuss the service project that he's gonna be engaging in and hopes to engage the entire community. And so I'll let Jacob speak. Hello, school committee. Thank you so much for letting me talk in the same room and the same Zoom meeting as well. Are we getting audio, Jacob? We're not, we're not getting audio, buddy. Can you hear me now? Yes, okay. Perfect. I'm not only honored here to be in the same room as you, but on the same Zoom meeting as well. Quite an honor. And today I'm going to talk about spring service, what we refer to in the Project 351 community as a service project that takes place in the spring. It is one of the two main service projects we do throughout the year. And it is a chance for an ambassador such as myself to lead the charge on something important for a charity. In this case, what well, you'll find out in a minute. So for this presentation, I'll talk about the who, the what, the when, the how, the why, 
of Spring Service 2021. And then I will dive deeper into organizations, Project 351, and Cradles to Crayons, what Spring Service will be donating to. Let's start with the who. So the two organizations, Project 351 and Cradles to Crayons. Project 351 is what Mr. Goldstein talked about just a few short seconds ago. And Cradles to Crayons is a clothing organization based in Boston for our reasons that gives gift bags to kids, mainly which includes clothes and other things such as books. What is Spring Service? It is a clothing drive for Cradles to Crowns to donate clothes. How this happens, students will bring clothes into school. We will then collect them. We will go through a quality sort to make sure the clothes are eligible to donate to Cradles to Crowns. And then we will ship them off at a regional facility. Um, this will take place the weeks of May 10th and 17th, two weeks after April break ends. And then where? So in the past, this has been more, mostly in Norton Middle School, but Mr. Goldstein said there's always been a possibility of going to all of Norton Public Schools, but we've never done it before, but it could happen. That was all I needed to say yes. So we are requesting for this fundraiser to take place in the entire school district. Why are we doing this? We're donating to Cradles to Crowns. So the organization I'm a part of, Project 351, has over 4,000 ambassadors this year. And this is another milestone year. Since this year, over 1 million neighbors will be served and 300,000 students and friends in service will be mobilized. And on the two pictures of my right here, they are small. The first one is a picture of what a launch day ceremony would normally look like. That could sadly not happen this year. And the second picture is a picture of a fall service that shows you a basic outlook of work that puts into this service. And what we are donating to is Cradles to Crowns. Cradles to Crowns has a whopping 1.7 million children served, roughly 430,000 volunteers and many agencies since 2002. The two pictures on your right show Cradles to Crowns in action from the service one on the bottom to the donation one on the top. I am very, very excited to take charge in this. I am ready. And that's it for me. That was awesome. Thank you, Jacob. So um, just to kind of elaborate a little bit further, um, in years past, we have Basically, as Jacob mentioned, this has only been a Norton Middle School sort of thing. And so I knew that Jacob was eager to expand um, and, you know, kind of uh, broaden the whole scope of the project. And I know that, um, you know, him and I batted around some ideas about how we can do that. And, you know, one of the reasons we wanted to discuss that here specifically with all of you is, you know, to let you folks understand as the school committee as the superintendent and assistant superintendent and others who are here, um, you know, what kind of role you can play. And of course, that basically being, um, you know, our cheerleaders and our champions, because many districts, um, you know, it, it's it's a collaborative effort when we try to do these projects. Um, and I know that, you know, the power that you wield is tremendous um, as far as influence and as far as getting the word out. So anything that and everything, you know, helps toward that end. And I am confident that, you know, we can, you know, achieve a, a pretty good goal. Um, and I think that, you know, this year more so than ever. The need that people have demonstrated across the Commonwealth, across the country is great, is really great. And I think if now, now really is the time to kind of say, all right, let's, let's buckle down and let's, let's do something good, um, you know, for, you know, our fellow citizens and that sort of thing. So, um, and it's very convenient to actually, in the sense that we're all back here now, because we've tried to do things throughout the course of this year, but it's been in fits and starts because we didn't have everybody here every day. Now that we have everybody here every day, it's much easier to kind of get in front of everybody and, and kind of put something out, you know, that people can really take in and digest. And so we're thankful that we're all back um, just to, you know, circle back to what we were talking about earlier. So. Great. Um, for, first and foremost, I, I want to say how, how proud I am of Jacob. Jacob is actually a, a good friend of mine. We've watched a, a lot of football together. <laughs> Um, and he is apparently the, the mini me of, of Patriots fans. So, <laughs> um, <laughs> now we're, we, we live and die. It's, it's ride or die, right, Jacob? Ride or die, baby. <laughs> um, uh, for, first question. Uh, so expanding this to all schools, is this something we need to approve or 
No, oh, you don't need to approve it, but it would be a nice thing to do because I think it would show the spirit of the school committee supporting this at all the schools and it allows for all employees in the community to know that you're in support of it. Okay, certainly let's start with that. Is there any discussion about that at all? No? I think it's a great idea, definitely. Okay, um, I would entertain a motion to expand Jacob's Cradles to Crayons Project to all of the schools in the Norton District. So moved. So moved. I will, Dan Sheedy, and second. Second. Who was the second? Was that you, Kathleen? And Kathleen Stern, second. Uh, all those in favor, Sherry Cohen? Yes. Kathleen Stern? Yes. Dan Sheedy? Yes. Carolyn Gallagher? Yes. And I don't know if I have to recuse myself. I mean, Jacob and I are, are tight, so no? Oh. Okay, so Denez Savas is a yes. <laughs> uh, great, Jacob, that's an awesome job. Thank you very much. It's, nice yeah, it's it's unfortunate that you, you didn't get to go to the, um, to the thing at the state house that that supposedly is really cool everybody who comes in every year talks really highly of that so that's unfortunate maybe they can get you guys in sometime at a later date but uh but that is uh it's unfortunate you missed that um phenomenal job again good friend of mine i'm super proud of him the family are family friends of mine so i, I know they raised him right and his dedication to service to others is, is phenomenal so good job jacob any other comments congratulations yes um Jacob, um, first of all, thank you so much for being a student leader um, and also expanding the program. I think uh, you know, you've, you are establishing something that could become the normalcy of how our 351 project uh, works in the future. So thank you for that. So on behalf of the Norton Public Schools, we would like to recognize Jacob Berry for participating in the 2021 Project 351 program as the Norton Public Schools Norton Middle School Ambassador. And it's signed by me, dated today. And because of social distancing, I make sure that you get this and we'll take a little picture um, if, so, if you allow me to do so and then bring up the parents and family that are here tonight. Okay, so two minute recess, if you don't mind. We will recess for two minutes. Mr. Chairman, if I may as well, um, I'd also like to thank Mr. Goldstein for his work. Um, yes. He has continuously, um, in the eight years that I've been here, been the leader at Norton Middle School to make sure that we're always involved. There Sometimes there's holes in these Project 351s by communities. We've been consistent through his work. So just publicly thank him for being a leader on this Project 351. Thank, thank you very Dr. much, Bayata. Mr. Goldstein. Thank you. Okay, and uh, for the for the members of the school committee, I'll, I'll confess to you that Thursday nights when I try and, and get out of here as fast as possible. Now we know why. <laughs> well, it's Jacob's Jacob's dad is one of the guys responsible, so <laughs> you can blame him. <laughs> okay, um, if you guys uh, if you guys want to take off, don't feel like you have to stick around. It's it's a long meeting, I know, and and people have homework and stuff, so. Take your time. Okay, next up, we're gonna move on to the 2021 Magna Award. I'll turn it over to Dr. Bayetta for that. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Um, a few months ago, I informed uh, the then chairwoman, Ms. Gallagher, um, that the American School Board Association, which you all belong to, um, has its own journal where it recognizes school districts for doing good things. Uh, very simple application, um, but yet reviewed um, where, um, a significant number of people apply every single year or based on a program that's been very successful. And as I thought about it um, for the first time ever that I had done this as a superintendent in, as you know, a couple of different districts, but since I've been here now for eight years, I just felt that there was one collective collaborative effort um, that the school committee, the administration, the Norton Teachers Association, um, 
really just f felt from day one was the most important thing about Norton Public Schools, and that is the social and emotional learning of students. Um, that if we if we make sure that that priority is where it should be, that grades and attendance and discipline and participation and civic duty and all of these things like Project 351 are, are so much easier to do, if you will. Um, so believe it or not, um, which I do believe, um, I, <laughs> um, I applied on behalf of the district for a uh, school system under 5,000, which is one of the categories. And we are a, uh, what's considered a magna first place winner for our priority one, social emotional learning. And I'll just give a brief synopsis, but it just says the Norton School Committee Administration in conjunction with the Teachers Association co-sponsored a support of the social emotional learning initiative. The rationale was simple, strong minds will lead to success in the classroom and life. In, in supporting this priority, the district spent a full academic year working through a task force. And some of you were here in this very room uh, prioritizing what we were going to do. But what was great about it is then it became a teacher leadership effort where we broke up into five different subcommittees and those subcommittees uh, did work. Now it became a little slower since COVID's come around, but um, now through the guidance of, uh, at the time, Gene Sullivan was highly involved with it and Vinnie Searcy. Now it's more under Vinnie Searcy's uh, title. He's got the longest title in the district for the record and he keeps growing every week. Um, he doesn't know it yet, but he's gonna get another one soon. Um, is um, is is the um, it's just the idea of being recognized. So so some of the things that stuck out for them was you know 45 to 55 teachers on Thursday night on Twitter responding to questions about how to change our look at student discipline and motivating students. I don't know if you remember the story, but it was actually Dan Sheedy who texted me one night and says, "Do you know there's like 50 Norton teachers on Twitter right now answering questions?" I said, "Yeah, it's a it's a book club that they're that they're uh, they're doing." Um, but it was also then instituting and bringing in our PB, PBIS, it was the so, social, social thinking, it was the zones of regulation, responsive classrooms, and so on and so on, that we had been doing in some ways, but we never had taken it to more of a district approach. Um, really proud of that. And then the, some of the evidence that we utilized were some of our panorama survey results, where our students were talking to us and, and saying that they felt supported or that we had uh, issues, for example, at the uh, one of our elementary schools, we actually saw an uptick in attendance um, as part of this whole social emotional development towards students. So we're being recognized for it. Um, I'd like to thank the, the school committee uh, for being a supporter of this initiative because in the days of MCAS, as you know, there's a lot of pressure to just score at the top on everything. And I think this committee since day one that I've been here has taken the approach that uh, sound mind, sound body scores will come. Um, it's just a matter of, of us doing the skill sets that our teachers have. This cannot be done without you, but more importantly, cannot be done without the Norton Teachers Association because they're putting their heart behind this. Um, and this is a, a few years of leaders, not just the last couple of years of leaders. Um, and it's a priority. And I think uh, we'll see ourselves ramping it up again as we get to some more normalcy. So I'd just like to thank everyone involved in this. Um, as well as you, the school committee. And um, it's, pu it's published in the um, American School Board Journal. Um, so it's nice to have the Norton name out in a publication that's seen by all school committee and school board members nationally. Thank you very much, Dr. Byer. I'll, I'll, I'll say that I, we don't do anything in this district for recognition. However, that being said, it, it certainly is nice to be recognized for right. things you're doing, particularly something as positive as this. So. Um, and, and certainly the, the, the teachers in Norton care and, and, and they're a big, big part of this. So uh, let me open it up to, to comments. I think I would just reiterate what you just said. I mean, it's, it's nice to be recognized um, as you know, we kind of always say that we like to be a leading district. And I think for sure, this is another example of, of how we are, um, you know, from the, from the top down with Dr. Bayetta and right through all the administration and the staff. So thank you to everybody that, that kind of make this happen. It's, it's nice to see. If I can just add, I think um, for me, I think Joe, you and I talked about this back in January, sort of this award. And I think that um, we were ahead of the curve, right? right. Um, that in no other time in our sort of current world or society have we had such a need for really supporting the social emotional needs of children. Um, and I think that we were really lucky 
that we had um, your guidance and really your support. And of course, the support of um, all of the staff of Norton Public Schools to really make this a collaborative effort. And I think we can see what happens when everybody works together towards a common goal. Um, and I think that this will be really important to start thinking about once we're back, because I do think that this pandemic has clearly um, created a lot of chaos in the lives of young children and families. So um, I'm really happy that we have the foundation already in place, that this isn't something that we're sort of trying to race to create. I think we had a really good concept. I was one of the people who sat in the room at, on sort of that initial brainstorming day, and I, I feel really honored to be part of it. So thanks to everybody um, who was really involved. And it is a, a great honor. I'm not exactly sure, Dr. Bayetta, how many um, schools or how many districts were part they, of this. So they, they typically provide a, a um, you know, grand prize, if you will. Actually, one of our um, Massachusetts districts this year was a grand prize winner, Mashpee Public Schools, for their initial uh, efforts around um, the idea of curriculum and instruction and Native American um, in that area, which is a, a very populated area and it has a history of Native American history. Um, they were the grand prize winner for, for, our, uh, for that uh, size district. Um, but it's typically a few hundred that apply. Sometimes it could be 90, could be 70, but uh, we didn't get an exact number. But um, one of the difficult situations they had this year, and it took it longer for them um, to get it out, was they decided to provide um, four winners within this category. Uh, because they were having, according to them, a difficult time really getting down to the choosing the differentiation because SEL is so important because topics around different cultures is so important. So um, and other programs that, that is, are in the journal of actually provide other ideas for us to do in Norton Public Schools outside of SEL that I think we, we should absolutely look at as well. Well, while, while I'm honored that we have we, we received this, I'm not surprised at all. Um, five years ago, when I started going to the conference, um, the school committee conferences, and they started talking about SEL then, I could say, well, we're already doing that. Well, we've already started that. Well, that's a program that we've already done. And a lot of people were coming to us, asking us questions about how we were doing it because we had already started it. Right. So we're not playing a catch up game. We're, we're playing a chug along game because we, we started this long before and thank goodness we did, because whoever would have had the foresight to see what was coming down the pike. So we already had a lot of things already in place, and we just have to keep making them bigger and better. And our kids' emotional health is first and foremost. Well said. Okay. Any other comments? No? Okay. If not, we're going to stick with Dr. Bayetta for the uh, virtual school application consideration and survey. Yeah. So this is literally a piece of information for you folks to have, but I just wanted to give you a little information. You don't have to do anything with it today or ever, but as you know, uh, the Commonwealth is has already announced and is pushing that we will be returning in the fall in a traditional sense. However, that we keep ourselves open to potential other ideas because of family needs and the concern for losing enrollment. As you know, we've lost almost a doubling of our um, um, uh, homeschool families. We know we have families still right now, about 275 or so students that are still under DLA, the Digital Learning Academy. So what does this really mean? We have some families already reached out to us and said, until my child is able to be vaccinated, I, I just don't see myself sending them to school. So. The Commissioner of Education, um, this has been published for a number of years, but really because of COVID, right now in the state, we have two state approved by the Commissioner and Board of Education, just like the charter school process, um, schools. One is out in Greenfield, the other one is tech over in um, the Walpole area, if I remember correctly. And they're both online and they are packed with students right now. They have been filled with students um, since this entire thing started. And so the commissioner reminded all of us, um, and I gave you the entire process, that there are there is the statewide initiative that requires uh, sign off by the commissioner, the school committee, and the board of education, a very lengthy process because you're actually doing it statewide. Um, these are considered new schools. Um, so within your, your, your realm of who's involved. The second is with the inter-district, which would be for example, X district and us get together and it's only our students. School choice students are not part of that ever, okay? Uh, believe me, I asked. Um, 
the uh, third one is yourself just doing it as a soul. And that soul one really just requires your vote, our application, your vote, and um, an academic structure for what it looks like. So everything from what curriculum are you using, uh, how what's the, what's the day look like for students and so on and so forth. So we've had some internal discussions about keeping this open. It is a four month process uh, for them. It would be due sometime, sometime in May. They're probably gonna give folks some different flexibility. We're also looking at providing those individual needs without going through this process, just like we would if we had a DLA and it was just uh, uh, utilizing a, a third party resource, but through us. So the students are still enrolled with us. They're still part of our sports and activities and so on and so forth. So um, this is for information for you. It's got, it's, it's getting a little bit of play in some communities. Um, there's a North Shore community with uh, somewhere in the vicinity of a thousand families that are interested in this. Uh, because of the concern that they have for coming back full time in person. I think there's a lot of mix of that. There's the people who health wise potentially need this. There's the I don't feel comfortable. So more a combination of feeling and mental health, if you will. And then I think there's the, you know, how do I do this? And I don't have to worry about physically going to school. So um, it's, it's for informational. And, and if you want me to look a little deeper into it, I'm happy to do so. Um, and, and provide you an update to see if, first of all, are there any local districts that are interested in partnering? We definitely don't want to lose 100 students or 200 students. Um, you know, our biggest decline in enrollment this year was because of our little Lancers preschool because we were not able to enroll and charge people tuition um, who are peer models. So, um, and, and rightfully so. I mean, it's it's crazy to charge $400 and, you know, the student isn't in school all the time. Um, but um, if you want us to look into it a little deeper, I can absolutely get some feelers out to my colleagues and say, what are they thinking? Are they thinking, not thinking? And then are there other collaborative ways that we could approach this as well? I think there's some, some stuff there that there's certainly some food for thought. Um, we can we can think about that and come back to you at a, at a later time. Does anybody have, have any questions or comments on that? No? Okay. Seeing none, we're going to turn it over to Mr. Searcy for the DESE Educational Stability Program Review Final Report. Thank you, everybody. Um, just one thing I wanted to say in terms of the uh, SEL award. I think um, we, we mentioned the teachers, but it, our bus drivers, van drivers, um, cafeteria workers, uh, custodians, they've all taken part in some of these trainings and offer some real nice support to our programs. Um, both the individual students and to the schools in general. So I, I didn't wanna leave them unmentioned because they're a really important part of what we try to do. Um, in terms of the educational stability program, uh, this is really a program that uh, the Department of Ed has us as school districts focus on to support three subgroups to make sure that they are able to register and receive register for school and receive uh, additional supports quickly um, when they when they need that. Uh, the uh, the three subgroups are folks who are experiencing homelessness or dislocation, uh, people that uh, students that are in foster care, and then our military families. And in part of the review, they look at three particular areas that we, they want to make sure that we have in place. Um, they notified us in the fall that we would be uh, part of this review. Uh, the first area is basically having a designated staff person that oversees training, make sure that the materials are there, um, that, our, that our registration process is, in, is published, um, and uh, it's easy for, uh, for folks to access what we're, what we're doing in terms of registering our students. So we have a, a liaison for the homeless, um, a Kinevento homelessness education, a point of contact for foster care, and then a liaison for uh, military families. The next part of that review is training. We need to make sure that our um, folks who do any kind of uh, registration, and that is both at the central office as well at school level, are trained in what, uh, what the laws say in supporting these three subgroups of families, as well as what the process is, um, how to communicate uh, any issues in it that may be, um, that we need to access in terms of uh, uh, transcripts or uh, medical files and so forth. So we had to train uh, those folks and we also had to train our counselors and what kinds of other supports in terms of case management are out there to support these families um, as they, they transition to our school system. And then finally, and you were folks were all part of this in the, I think early winter, we had to do a review of all our policies and procedures 
um, and make sure that they're up to date. We made a few changes and um, then we su submitted all of that to DESE. And uh, we, we found out last week that we have, we have been, um, everything has been implemented and we are up to, to code and ready to go. And they supported, um, supported us through that process. And so um, that is it. We, we did a great job as a, as a district. They were very happy with us and um, we had no corrections that had to be made. Great. I, I, I hate to say I, I would have assumed that, but I did kind of assume that. To be honest. <laughs> <laughs> All right, anybody have any questions or comments on that? No? All right. Seeing none. Thank you very much, Mr. Searcy. No Great problem. job. Okay. We're moving on here to the uh, review and vote on the school committee meeting dates for 2021-2022 school year. Dr. Bayetta. Um, so the dates are as, as published. Um, there are 17 regular school committee meetings that are scheduled. Um, and we stayed away from vacation weeks and all of that stuff. Um, and that does not include any town meetings, usually one in October and one in the fall. Sometimes we even have one in February um, in the past. Um, but this calendar would um, get us into that two in, two in September, two in October, potentially a third of a town meeting, one in November, two in December, um, two in January, one in February, two in March, two in April, two in May. So, and again, a town meeting potentially in May. So it keeps us away from, from really a lot of the meetings we've had this year. As you know, we've, we've had significantly more meetings this year because of, of COVID. So yeah. um, hopefully uh, this is a better schedule for everybody. And, you know, we can always add drop as needed. Okay, before we, uh, before we vote on this, I assume the assumption is we're gonna um, continue to do a 6.30 meeting. Is, is there a reason or is there any objection to, to moving that to six, moving that earlier? Would anybody have a problem with that? I would. <laughs> no. I, I, Dan, is that a problem for you? No, I, th I think originally we went 630 because I, I could not make earlier meetings. And I, I think that's, that there's going to be some flexibility there for me moving forward. So if we want to do it earlier, that that would work for me. So. I, if you would like to publish it as your meeting dates and they start at 6 p.m., I am fully supportive. Are, are people okay with that? Okay, so let's let's yeah. look at six o'clock then. Okay. Could we um, also, um, you know, I, I know in the past we've tried to do some joint meetings and things like that. So could we, once this is approved, could we get the schedule over um, to the select board and FinCom and maybe be a little more proactive? on say like we should have a joint meeting this date as opposed to scrambling at the last minute to say are you guys available are you guys available we'll just say these are the meetings we can do six to six thirty if we have stuff and as the other groups can and then just go right into a joint meeting for say seven or something sure yeah so you're thinking set set times for for joint meetings that's not a bad idea actually yeah i mean if you're, you're gonna have stuff in the fall prior to town meeting and have stuff you know as it goes so it's a budget yep. season as well but i think just just saying these are our meetings. We moved to Thursdays because of the joint meetings, at least with the select board. So I think we just put a little more pressure and open up some more dialogue on it. Right. That makes sense. Okay. Um, if there's no comment or, or issue with the meeting dates we have here, I would entertain a motion to approve them as written. I do have one question. So are we going to be able to still Zoom? like? Dan's home tonight, but he's still part of the meeting. Is this still something that's going to continue next year? Or we don't know that yet? We don't know that. And that is controlled by executive order of the governor. So if, as you know, he just backed away from one of the executive orders on travel. If you remember that one, it's down just a recommendation. So any of these things is going to go through his office. Now, you can, as a body, you, we've decided tonight to be in person, but publicly, we're, we're not wanting to have a room with 500 people. So uh, that's why we continue to kind of zoom, if you will, and not we're not able to do any business unless we are on zoom. So uh, ex except for executive session, of course. So um, it, that's all under um, the executive orders of uh, government and the flexibility that they'll they'll give us. Yep. So we do, however, have the option if it's a non zoom meeting if, and correct me if I'm wrong, by all means, if it's a non zoom meeting, just a regular school committee meeting, we do have a remote availability option correct wasn't that approved by the town a couple yes, of years you, back you have a remote option available to you as long as a majority is physically present okay so in other words tonight there's a majority physically present and you're not here it gives you the full right to still participate and vote 
Ok. So Any other to... questions or comments? No? Okay, I would uh, entertain a motion to approve the dates as written. So moved. Second. Second, Kathleen Stern. Uh, roll call vote, Sherry Cohen. Yes. Kathleen Stern. Yes. Dan Sheedy. Yes. Carolyn Gallagher. Yes. And Denez Savas is a yes as well. Okay, next up is a discussion and vote on the spring athletic fees. Dr. Baeta, over to you. Mr. Chairman, thank you. We, the, uh, from the athletic director and the business office and maintaining a fee of $200 for the spring with a balanced budget projection. So this does a, this does not hurt us in any way, shape, or form for the spring budget by maintaining it at two hundred dollars for the spring budget, and for purposes of some equity. Although there's playing a few more games, the fact of the matter is, I recommend we keep it at two hundred dollars. Okay, I certainly have no objection. Does anyone else have a comment or question on that? No. No. Okay. Uh, seeing none, I would entertain a motion to set the spring athletic fees at two hundred dollars. So, so moved. moved. <laughs> so moved by everybody. <laughs> we'll say Sherry Cohen on that. Uh, second. Second. Second, Kathleen Stern. Uh, roll call. One vote. clarification, real quick. This is for all spring sports, correct? That's correct. Okay. That's fine. Thank you. Okay. Uh, Sherry Cohen? Yes. Kathleen Stern? Yes. Dan Sheedy? Yes. Caroline Gallagher? Yes. And Denise Savas is a yes as well. Okay, next up we have other business. Does anybody have any other business to bring before the school committee? I just have one new one vote that you have to take from the beginning, um, and that is the signing of the warrants. Um, I need um, a motion to appoint whoever is going to be the number one signer of the warrants and who's going to be the backup. Uh, okay. You do that, um, and you can maintain it the way you want, which right now is Ms. Cohen and Ms. Stern, or you can change it. Okay. Are you guys okay with that? Okay, I guess we'll uh, we'll maintain it then. Uh, so we need a motion. Motion. To, okay, yep. um, I would entertain a motion to appoint um, Sherry Cohen as the primary and Kathleen Stern as the secondary signer of warrants. So moved. Dan she moved. Second. Second. Carol Gallagher. Gallagher. Second. Uh, all those in favor? Sherry Cohen. Yes. Kathleen Stern. Yes. Dan Sheedy. Yes. Carolyn Gallagher. Yes. And Denez Savas is a yes as well. Mr. Chairman, item number two, um, you received tonight an MCAS update. I don't know if, uh, Jen, if you want to speak to it real quick. Um, sure. I, I know you all love hearing about MCAS and getting this information from me. Um, even though we're in a pandemic, uh, we are still participating in our statewide assessment this year. Unfortunately, the US Department of Education did not allow states to apply for a non-testing waiver. However, Massachusetts was able to apply for a waiver that gave us flexibility in the year's administration. Uh, so some of the flexibilities that are available this year, we have a later testing window in order to maximize curriculum exposure for students. Um, they also shortened the testing windows for grades three through eight. So typically uh, our students in grades three to eight would have two days of testing for ELA and two days of testing for math. Um, those are down to one day for each grade level and subject area. They also have modified the competency determination for our current seniors, the class of 2021, and that's students that have not passed the MCAS yet to earn that graduation determination, have other ways of earning that. So it doesn't have to be that be all for them. Um, and then they're also providing accountability relief for districts. Districts will not be ranked on accountability measures this year. The state is really pushing that it's used for a diagnostic assessment so that we can see where our students are. Um, we have measures that we use internally as well for that. So um, this is just another piece of information for us. Additionally, the commissioner is going to be um, approaching the Board of Education around the class of 2022 and um, waiving that MCAS requirement for those juniors as part of their graduation requirement as well. Um, so they're looking into that. They have not voted on it yet. Um, but for our juniors that have not yet tested, they still are able to take the test if they're interested in the Adams Scholarship um, process. 
Um, finally, our students that are enrolled in the Digital Learning Academy are also still required to test this spring. We are working with families to bring them into the district to test. And if they're not able to come in, they will have the option to test remotely. So we're working on the logistics of that and how that's going to work. Mrs. Winsper and I met this morning to try to figure out exactly how that works. Um, we're all learning new things. And then just um, the dates of our tests are there for you as well. We're still finalizing the testing dates for the high school um, as we are waiting for our seniors to be done with their classes and out of the building. So we'll have a little bit of more flexibility in terms of spacing and um, test proctors. So as always, here I am to bring you the best MCAS news. Okay, well, we certainly appreciate their allowing us assessments. It's not something we would have ever thought to do ourselves. And uh, we appreciate the flexibility and what can only be considered a massive waste of our time. So, um, yeah, yeah, whatever. You, you guys know how I stand on them, MCAS. So, okay, uh, is there any other business before us? I just wanted to um, wish everyone a great um, April vacation. We just opened up fully, as you know, as of last Thursday this week with the uh, with the high school. Um, we've had some up and downs because of quarantining. Uh, our numbers are still low for positives. Um, people are just being as flexible as they can. Uh, I know that there's stress, but we, from my office to the staff, to families, um, and by staff, I mean all of our employees, um, just a, a sincere thank you um, for being one of the first in the area to do it, uh, to continue to prioritize safety um, as the number one um, discussion every single day and, and on weekends and at night and during vacation probably. Um, but we're very appreciative. Um, and I think, uh, you know, the hours and the time I'm going to um, single out one group because I haven't done so. And I think it's important to, and that is our school nurses. Um, they are the key on making these decisions and recommendations for quarantining and positives and making phone calls. And I can assure you that they are not just doing it during their regular work day. They are doing it after hours. They are here till Friday nights until the wee, until literally 6.30, 7 at night. Um, February vacation, they received phone calls and information. So just a, a sincere thank you to the six of them for their work and their efforts for going way above and beyond as members of the Norton Teachers Association. Um, I, you know, singling out is always difficult during the pandemic, but I, I've tried to do it w from the heart and, and this group has just gone way above and beyond, um, in the, especially in the last few months because they have a lot of responsibility um, in making those determinations and decisions. So thank you to our six professionals. I just want to add one quick thing, just an observation. So I've been um, in Mansfield schools quite a bit lately, like every day. Um, and the one thing that I've noticed more than anything is that the little nitpicky things between the kids, he pushed me, he touched me, he, you know, that's obviously not happening, but neither is he called me a name or she did this or somebody hurt my, they're just so happy and so thankful to be back in school together Yep. that it's it, just the whole feeling in the classroom is just amazing. I've in 17 years, I've never had this happen ever. So I know it's hard. I know people are making sacrifices. I know it's hard for parents to be the yo-yo of your remote because of a quarantine or what I understand that, but for the overall good of these kids and their psyche, it's what's been really needed. And can I just circle back um, for a second? I know on our favorite topic of MCAS, because I think it would be important um, and, and would be nice if we as a school committee and as a district reminded our teachers and our parents that this is just a test. To not put a whole lot of pressure on our kids for this test, just relax, do the best you can. You know, I, I just think it's important as a district for something to go out, for people to understand we are not, we're not really looking at this. We really aren't. It is, it's yeah. a waste of our time. It's ridiculous that they're doing it. So kids go out, do your best. And parents, please just have a little bit of grace with the kids. They, it, this, is, this is crazy. So I would just hope as a district, we might be able to do that. We will. Thank you. Last minute shout out, uh, KW, Karen Whisper coming tonight. Uh, she had nothing on the agenda, director of instructional <laughs> tech. Paul Driscoll, again, long days for the, those folks um, just for setting us up tonight and making it run so smoothly. I just want to make sure that I shout them out as well. Yes, uh, th thank you very much to them. And before we um, go into yeah. a motion to adjourn, do we have a link for the executive session? 
Uh, we do not. We'll be calling. Mr. Sheedy will be calling in. Okay. So, because we're here live. Perfect. That's what I need to know. And you need a motion to adjourn to not return to go into executive session for the purposes of union and non-union contract discussions, and you will not be returning back to the regular session. Correct. Okay, I would entertain a motion to adjourn the regular session meeting and enter into executive session for the purposes of discussions of non-union and union contracts, not to return to regular session. Carolyn Gallagher. Gallagher, Cohen. Cohen. Second Cohen. Uh, roll we were call. told to use our names. <laughs> roll call vote. Sherry Cohen. Yes. Kathleen Stern. Yes. Dan Sheedy. Yes. Carolyn Gallagher. Yes. And Denise Savas is a yes. Okay. Thank you, everybody, for coming, and uh, good night.